Well, good morning. I'd like you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to read from chapter 14 and verse 17, and we're going to read all the way through the entire chapter 15. So beginning in verse 17, of course, our title this morning is going to be a very simple one, the useless vine, the useless vine. So beginning in verse 17, he says, or if I bring a sword upon that land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah and Daniel and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword the fam and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and you shall see their way and their doings, and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concern, concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work, or will men take a pin of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. It is, is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burnt? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate, because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord God. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. Well, we wanted to kind of finish off chapter 14 with some leftover business there. Uh, so we're breaking in in verse 17. And so he's talking about these four score judgments. Uh, he mentions them in verse 21, for thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four score judgments upon Jerusalem. And we had mentioned last time that this all goes back to the covenant that Israel had entered into what we call the Mosaic Covenant, and it was an agreement between them and God, and they basically they agreed that they would behave themselves, and they'd do everything that the Lord asked them to do. But God said to them, okay, but if you don't hold up your end of the covenant, if you do not do everything that the covenant says, there will be consequences, and part of the consequences would be the judgments that were found in Leviticus 26. And let's just read them uh, again, just to remind ourselves, necessary background, Leviticus 26, where the Lord tells them what would happen if they failed to keep their end of the bargain and obey this covenant. So Leviticus 26, and we're going to break in in verse 22, and we just read down to verse 26, and it, it tells you the four score judgments, what they are. And so he says in verse 22, uh, well, verse 21, just to the context, if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I'll bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children 
and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me, by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you and shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send the pestilence among you. And you shall be delivered unto into the hand of the enemy. And, and when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight. And you shall eat and not be satisfied. And if you walk not after all this, hearken unto me, but will walk contrary unto me. And he goes on. So we, we see the four score judgments that are mentioned here, and we see them being filled out literally here after much long suffering from the Lord. Now, uh, as it were, judgment day has come. Uh, now uh, they're about to face these things. And of course, they had hoped that if there was some intercessor, uh, somebody like Abraham when he interceded for Sodom or somebody like Moses when he interceded for the nation of Israel, things might uh, still be preserved. They might uh, escape this, this certainty of judgment. But of course, uh, he reminds them that though these three men were in it, Noah, Daniel, and Job, uh, it wouldn't avail. They'd save themselves alone, not even their own children. And so he says, verse 17, or if I bring a sword upon that land, and say, sword, go through the land that I cut off from man and beast. That's Leviticus 26, 25. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they, they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence, again, that's Leviticus 26, 25, uh, into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off of it man and beast. Again, verse twenty says this, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. In other words, it's too late. It's gone too late for intercessors. Uh, God had been long-suffering with them over many, many generations, and they had still rebelled against him, failed to keep his covenant, and so Payday had arrived, judgment day was come, and even intercessory prayer from godly men like Noah, Daniel, and Job would be to no avail. And so he says in verse 21, kind of summarizing, for thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four saw judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noise and beast, the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. So again, he's going to bring this judgment. But then we read about a remnant in verse 22 and 23. But what is interesting is when we tend to think of a remnant, usually we think of a faithful remnant, don't we? We always have this idea in our mind that from the days of Elijah, for instance, that he, you know, I've got 700 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. So, so we tend to think of a remnant always in terms of a faithful remnant. But unfortunately, this remnant is anything but faithful. And so he tells us in verse 22, yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant. And so immediately our mind goes, oh, this is good. There's a faithful remnant, even in the midst of this judgment. But then he goes on and he says, concerning this remnant, that shall be brought forth. So they're going to escape the, the four score uh, judgment of God both sons and daughters, behold, they shall come forth unto you. And notice now, and you shall see their way and their doings. And you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their doings. You shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. And so here is the thought that this, this group that come out are anything but a godly remnant. In fact, when the ones in captivity see them, what they're going to say is, yeah, God, you are absolutely just to bring judgment on this kind of people. Uh, in other words, their, their wickedness will be so evident that they will acknowledge that the judge of all the earth did right. 
Remember that verse from Genesis 18, verse 25, will not the judge of the, all the earth do right? Well, this remnant is going to signal to those that are in already in captivity that he did right to bring calamity and judgment on this people. God did the right thing. By the way, I, I, I believe that when we come to the judgment uh, in uh, that we read about in Revelation 20, one of the purposes of that judgment is going to vindicate God for what he's about to do in judging the human race. Remember, every mouth will be stopped. All the world will be guilty before God, and God will be seen to be acting perfectly righteously in judging humanity uh, because of their persistent, rebellious, sinful rejection of the only hope for human, the human race, and that is the Son of God. And it will be shown to them that they have rejected uh, Christ and are worthy of that judgment. So just a, a couple more thoughts before we kind of summarize this uh, end of this chapter um, 14. And that is this, um, just remarkable again, just to remind ourselves of how well known Daniel's piety was even at this stage. He had now been about 12 years in an important office in the royal court and possessed the very highest rank. Uh, he's also mentioned, his wisdom is mentioned in chapter 28 of Ezekiel and verse 3, uh, when it talks about the king of Tyre, thou art wiser than Daniel. So his reputation for wisdom and for godliness of character was well known throughout Babylon. And I suppose in some ways, when they were thinking, well, maybe somebody's going to intercede for us, maybe they thought it might be Daniel. Because if anybody had the ear of Nebuchadnezzar, it would be Daniel. He's in the royal court. He's interacting with men like Nebuchadnezzar on a daily basis. And he was a very holy man and a most patriotic Israelite. And so maybe their hopes that Jerusalem would be spared was based on the fact that, hey, Daniel is right there. Just like, you know, the book of Esther, maybe uh, God had brought Daniel to the kingdom for just such a time as this, and that he would go in and the king would, as it were, put out the scepter and everything would go well. But sadly, God is telling them, no, even if Daniel, as well as Noah and Job were there, it's too late. Also, just one other little comment that maybe we don't think about, but it's interesting that Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporary, and they were fellow prophets. But there's no thought of envy here in Ezekiel's writing when he speaks of his fellow prophet. He speaks of him as obviously a man of godliness, a man of great um, wisdom, and he does it in a very nice way. And so I just love this. There's no spirit of competition here amongst the prophets of God. There's, a, there's a, a, a love and a respect for Daniel that's very evident. And you see a similar thing in the New Testament when Peter talks about Paul. And I, I love this. And especially I love it because uh, on at least on one occasion, Paul had to rebuke Peter to his face. And yet you don't see a pouting Peter here in 2 Peter chapter 3, even though he had been rebuked to the face by the Apostle Paul on a previous occasion, he says, an account the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and un unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. By the way, I suggest that it might be the epistle to the Hebrews that he's referring to there when he speaks of those scriptures. But just I just think it's delightful just to observe at least that there is no spirit of competition amongst the servants of God. They speak of each other and they speak without envy. They speak with appreci mutual appreciation 
of their fellow servants. And that's a good lesson for all of us, isn't it? Don't we appreciate the Lord's servants? And I hope we speak well of them and not be, enter into any sense of envy uh, or uh, speaking ill of them. And I just thought that was an interesting little observation. Well, that leads us to chapter 15. And just to kind of remind ourselves, this is a, it's a parable of a vine, and this is a useless vine. And so I want to just kind of remind us of, of the kind of little series we're going through in Ezekiel from chapter 13 onwards. And, and of course, these are oral messages. He's, he's already done object lessons. He's now giving oral messages. And so we saw in chapter 13 the unfaithful prophets. And we saw prophets and prophetesses that were not speaking in his name. They weren't giving the message that God intended. And so he rebukes the unfaithful prophets. And then in chapter 14, we saw unseen idolatry. We saw the elders who were coming to ask questions. And God said, should I even answer them? Because these men, their idols are in their hearts. And so there was unseen idolatry to the eyes of men, but it was seen by God. And he said, these guys are still caught up with their idols. And that was chapter 14. And now we come to the useless vine. And we're going to move on. Chapter 16 is going to be the unfaithful wife. We may even get a little bit into chapter 16, the unfaithful wife. And then chapter 17, the unreliable promises. And so it's kind of a, a sequence of messages. Uh, and this particular chapter 15 is the first of three consecutive uh, parabolic teaching, or, or some would say even allegories that he's going to give. And so um, in in still speaking with the, the elders of Israel before him, chapter 14, verse 1, it says, then came certain of the elders of Israel to me and sat before me. So these messages, we haven't seen anything different. So it's still these messages are being given to the elders that have come to Ezekiel's house and are sat before him, seeing if he has any word from the Lord. And so it's with these elders that are that are in his house that are still in view listening to these messages. And some of them were still unconvinced by Ezekiel and Jeremiah, thinking that Jerusalem would never fall into the hands of the defiled Gentiles. After all, and here's what we want to see. After all, first of all, Israel was Jehovah's special vine, planted by him in the promised land. Right? So why would God ever judge his promised or his special vine? And so chapter 15 will answer that. And then they would say, you know, Jerusalem will never fall because uh, because the nation was married to Jehovah in divine covenant, and he would never divorce her. And so that's when we're going to look at chapter 16 and the unfaithful wife. And then the third thing is they might think to themselves, well, the Davidic dynasty was like a tall, sturdy cedar tree that could never be felled by the Gentiles. And chapter 17 will deal with that. So in a sense, he, uh, these parabolic uh, messages are dealing with specific things that they would have in their minds. Like, God's never going to judge us. We're, we're his special vine. Uh, we're married to Jehovah. He'll never do that. And then, of course, the Davidic dynasty is like this tall cedar tree. Uh, we're, we're secure. So he's going to answer them uh, in these parables. See, they understood that they were the chosen people, his chosen people, his choice vine. How could he destroy them? It would, they would even say, we've been through the fire of two invasions and deportations by the Babylonians. But each time, we've endured. We've sprouted up again. So they did not believe that God's judgments would destroy Judah, as Ezekiel had proclaimed. So Ezekiel is going to use these three images to teach the nation that the Lord was judging her because he had this special relationship with them. And of course, privilege brings with it responsibility and responsibility brings with it accountability. And so he's going to deal with the fact that these people who had such privilege, yeah, they were his special mind, but sadly they had not brought forth fruit and were actually a useless vine and worthy of judgment. 
And so we're going to be looking at this uh, thought. So begins this way in verse 1 of chapter 15, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So again, remember this man can only speak when God's word comes to him. He's mute apart from that. So here's another message that he has for these elders. Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? What is the vine tree more than any tree? No doubt the people listening, these elders, would say, of course, it's superior in every way. That's what they would think, because, of course, it, its purpose is to produce fruit, which uh, both blesses both man and God. And so they would say, oh, it, it's really special. That would be the thought that they would be on their mind. And so the vine tree is clearly a figure of Israel, employed elsewhere in the Old Testament, often denoting the idea of Israel as a chosen vine planted and cared for by God. And it's a, it's a repeated idea, This the idea that Israel were a chosen vine. So I want to look at some of the references, and we, we want to think about them. Uh, so we begin in the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 5. Again, thinking of Israel in that terms of the 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 chosen vine, uh, especially chosen by God. And so we'll notice in Isaiah 5 and verses 1 through 7, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it. Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now I'll go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, and there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard, vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So again, not a very complimentary. In other words, uh, this, this prophecy of Isaiah talks about the fact that this vineyard, everything had been done for it, to encourage fruit bearing. The best care of the master cultivator. He'd fenced it. He'd cleared off all the stones. The best vine had been planted. A tower for protection had been built. Uh, so everything's done in spite of all the tender care of Jehovah for the vineyard. The vines produce nothing but wild grapes. The picture perfectly shows the history of the nation of Israel in its relationship with Jehovah, its failure to produce anything to gladden his heart. In fact, it seems to have caused him nothing but grief. What a tragedy uh, that this nation. Now let's look at Jeremiah. Again, we're just looking at these different references that God has given to this picture of them being a chosen vine, but at least here, it's just wild grapes. In chapter 2 of Jeremiah and verse 21, and you notice that there's a consistency about this. He says, Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Again, what a statement. That this noble vine, holy a right seed, Again, coming from Abraham and from such stock, you would think it would bear much fruit for God. 
Uh, so it came from a right seed, but it turned into a de degenerate mind. And the word degenerate, I just kind of was looking it up. I thought it was interesting. It has the idea of decline mentally and morally. And so here's a nation that since God began to do dealings with it, has done nothing but decline mentally and morally. Oh, what a shocking statement. And so uh, we have it there again, uh, this reference uh, to, to the vine. Now, um, we, we want to look at uh, just a couple of other references that are of interest to us in regards to this. Um, Hosea chapter 10 in the minor, first of the minor prophets in verse 1. He says, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. And so again, an empty vine, because the fruit that should have been brought to God has instead been directed towards idols. Again, not exactly complimentary uh, about uh, the nation of Israel. And then, of course, uh, one uh, further reference in Psalm 80 uh, that would again refer to this this oft-repeated picture of Israel as a vine. It says, uh, Psalm 80, verse 1 and 2, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the, the cherubim, shine forth uh, before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. And uh, where am I looking for? It's in these verses that talks about them being a vine. Um, yeah, verse 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and it filled the land. The hills were covered with a shadow of it and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars she sent out her boughs unto the sea and her branches to the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? Uh, so again, the boar of the, out of the wood doth waste it. The wild beast of the field doth devour it. And so again, uh, the psalmist is even recognizing uh, after such wonderful origins and beginnings, uh, this, uh, this vine is now experiencing uh, desolation and judgment from God. Of course, the New Testament also talks about Israel in terms of a vine. Now, we won't look at all the references, but I want to just look at, I'll mention two references. We'll just look at one, uh, Matthew 21, just for the sake of time, because they're kind of lengthy sections. But Matthew 21, and we might also look at a parallel account. We won't do it right now, but I'll give you the reference. It's in Luke 20, verse 9 through 19. But in Matthew 21 and verse 33, following, uh, the Lord Jesus speaks. And this is what he says. Here, another parable, there was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. This is Matthew 21, 33. And hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit draw near, he sent his servants to the husbandman that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servant and beat one, killed another, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, and I love this verse, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. They caught him, cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in the season. Jesus said to them, did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you 
and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, and whosoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And notice verse 45. I love this verse. It says, when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them. <laughs> they knew what he was saying. And so what a tragedy. Uh, so what does Ezekiel add to this vineyard story? Because obviously it's mentioned over and over again in Scripture. And so um, what, is, what does Ezekiel say? Now, by the way, there's one we haven't read, and that's in John 15, 1 through 7. We'll come back to that one because we're going to see in that one that there is a true Israelite who alone will produce fruit for God. And those that will depend on him will indeed be fruitful people. And we'll look at John 15 in a moment. But what does Ezekiel tell us? What does he add to the story? And what he's telling us is this. What is the value of a vine tree other than to bear fruit? Its sole purpose is fruit bearing. Apart from that, it is utterly useless. And it's interesting in this chapter that we've just read in chapter 15 of Ezekiel, that there's no mention anywhere of fruit, either in the presence or absence of it. It is just not mentioned. And it's a dramatic way, but Ezekiel is communicating that at this point in Israel's history, as he writes, there was absolutely no free fruit to speak of. It was not an issue. No fruit whatsoever. That's why they're so ripe for judgment. No fruit, despite all of the care that God has shown to them, there's absolutely no fruit. A vine would never be cultivated for the sake of its wood. It's really worthless, but as it bears fruit. What is Israel? Good for nothing. But as God influenced them to bring forth fruit for his glory, that was their purpose of existence. But now they have ceased to be fruitful in any way and therefore are good for nothing, but like a withered branch of the vine to be burnt. And so that's the message that he's given here. And so he says, what is the vine tree more than any tree or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? And again, it's it's of no value. He says, shall wood be taken there, of verse 3, to do any work? Or will men take a pin of it and hang any vessel thereon? So he says, it's really too crooked to use it for construction. It's so soft you can't even make a peg out of it to hang something upon it. Uh, it's weak and crooked and... Um, and again, has no value. Of course, this idea of a peg uh, is used in Scripture as something that at least has some usefulness. Uh, it, it has to do with something that can be relied on. And just look at a couple of references to a peg that is mentioned uh, in the Scriptures. Isaiah 22. Isaiah 22 and verse 3. Sorry, verse 23, 22, verse 23, he says, uh, well, we'll break in verse 22. It says, um, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder and he shall open and none shall shut it. He shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity from the vessel of cups, even to all the vessels of flag flagons. So again, this is speaking of a man called Eliakim and uh, how he uh, would be somebody who would be defend dependable uh, for a while and, and uh, would, would have a good uh, purpose. Uh, Zechariah at chapter 10. Again, the same idea of the peg being something dependable, useful. Um, Zechariah 10, something you can hang something on. Uh, verse uh, 4, he says, Out of him cometh forth the corner, out of him the nail, or the peg, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. Speaking of Judah, and again, it's the messianic idea 
uh, here, the the peg, the one that the, that Israel could depend upon, that would uh, be uh, useful and dependable. And then one more reference in the book of Ezra, and chapter nine and verse eight. Book of Ezra. which has suddenly gone missing out of my Bible. I know it's in there somewhere. There we go. Ezra 9, verse 8. We read this. It says, And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail, against the same word peg there, in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. So usually it's it's just it has the idea of someone or something that could be relied on or depended on. And the thought here is this: that because the vine tree uh, had couldn't even be used to make a peg, and so the idea is this: Israel was neither useful nor dependable unless they were bringing forth fruit. It's good for nothing. No, not so much as to make a pin or a peg or to hang a hat or bridle on because it is a sappy and brittle wood. Uh, they uh, think the same of the empty vine, the profligate professor being abominable, disobedient to every good work, reprobate. No value unless there is fruit. And so again, back in Ezekiel, we'll notice in verse 4 of Chapter 15, Ezekiel 15, verse 4, he says, Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. It is, meat. is it meat for any work? You see, it burns up pretty rapidly, so it's not even valuable for fuel. And here's a thought, too, that uh, when it comes to metals, if you put metal in a fire it actually burns away the dross and it actually becomes more useful. But if you put the vine in the fire, it doesn't enhance its intrinsic value. It makes it worse. So the idea is this, God, the divine carpenter, has not been able to make anything out of this vine nation. Now that it has been partly charred by the fires of judgment, it's even more useless and must be burnt up. That's the picture judgment has to come on this nation. They cannot depend on the idea that they're uh, God's chosen vine. Verse 6, he says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Judgment is certain. This is the application. As the vine tree is given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of of Jerusalem. Jehovah is the one who throws the wood into the fire. The wood re represents their own uh, compatriots, the residents of Jerusalem. They're about to burn up. See, the nation of, of Israel was like, um, never was like any other nations in military strength and riches, except when they were trusting in the Lord. The only time that they were ever uh, excelling amongst the nations is when they were in a right relationship with God. During the days of David and Solomon, then oh, it was a different story. Uh, but since the days of David and Solomon, it has been all downhill and very little fruit for God has been seen in this nation's history. It's been unproductive, like an uncultivated mine, like a wild mine tree. Verse 7, he says, I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And so what a chilling statement. I'll set my face against them. They're going to go from one fire to another, devouring them. They shall know that I am the Lord when God sets his face against them in judgment. So Ezekiel saw the nation's... Uh, taste of fire, the first taste of fire in 605 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar took the temple treasures to Babylon, along with some of the best young men like Daniel. 
597 BC, the second deportation, when Ezekiel was among the captives. 588 BC, the siege of Jerusalem begins. 586 BC, the city is going to be destroyed and burned with fire. Second Chronicles 36, 19 will give us the fulfillment of this final burning of that vineyard, that vine tree. 36 of Second Chronicles and verse 19. He says this, and they burnt the house of God, break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burn all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. Literal fire of destruction was coming to the city of Jerusalem. So was God going to spare this choice vine because it was special and choice? No, it was going to uh, come to definite judgment. I will make the land, he says, verse 8, desolate, because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord God. And of course, the land would indeed be left desolate. So much for the false hope of being God's chosen vine. But that brings us to the one passage we didn't mention, and that's in John 15. And we've looked at this on a previous occasion, but it's good to remind ourselves of this marvelous passage that the Lord Jesus as the true Israelite alone is able to bring fruit for God. And so he says, I am the true vine. 15.1. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away every branch that bears fruit. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. And he goes on, talks about abiding in me as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself Except to divide in the vine, neither more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, neither abideth in me, and I in him, same brings forth much fruit. And so as the disciples of the Lord Jesus, it's good to remind ourselves that he is the vine, and we're just branches. If we want to bear fruit for God, we must learn to abide in him. Of course, he talks about, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Allowing God's word, as it were, to change us, to, to mold us, to shape us, depending on the Lord Jesus to do this, to produce fruit in our lives. The Father is the fine dresser. He'll take whatever measures are necessary to cause us to bear fruit. Branches who do not produce fruit are pruned, so they do produce fruit and produce more fruit. And of course, uh, he, he'll ch chasten us if necessary. Uh, that we might bring forth uh, the fruits of righteousness. And so the fruit of the vine, which produces wine, of course, is that which cheereth God and man. Israel was severely chased, chastened for its failure. And in our day, God provides every assistance for fruit bearing. But in a day of review, there are rewards to update, obtained or loss sustained as our fruit is going to be assessed by him who is the true vine. And so again, just good to remind ourselves, are we truly those that are bearing fruit for God? Sadly, the nation of Israel, no other purpose of a vine than to produce fruit. And they, for the most part in their history, were fruitless for God. Uh, in fact, just uh, brought forth a stench, really. And so, again, what a challenge. And uh, they can't hope in that. And so, as if that wasn't enough for them, the next chapter is going to leave them reeling. Now, we're just going to say a few introductory words about this final chapter oh, that we're going to look at this morning, verse 16. Um, and um, it's the longest chapter just as uh, the one we've just read is one of the shortest chapters, chapter 15. Chapter 16 is the longest chapter in the book of Ezekiel. 63 verses long, to be precise. Now, this particular chapter, the rabbis did not allow this chapter to be read in public. Not because of its length, because of its content. Because there's a lot of talk about Ordem, harlotry, Israel as an unfaithful wife. 
And so it was felt unsuitable uh, for young Israelites to hear this read in public. But because we're committed to going verse by verse, we're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to read it. We're going to have to think about it. It's a, it is a magnificent allegory. Jerusalem and Judah's sin is set forth in the strongest possibly terms here in this chapter. Although there are many metaphors here, yet it isn't really all metaphorical. Where there was so much idolatry, which there was, as we saw in chapter 8, as well as idolatry, there always is accompanying adultery, fornication, prostitution, lewdness of every description. That's why idolatry was so popular, because it was a way to religiously indulge the flesh. And so it appealed to men. Uh, they can still be religious, and they can indulge their baser uh, appetites uh, with a religious dimension to it. So although a lot of this is pictorial language, there's a lot more reality or literalness to it. Because the target audience in this chapter is Jerusalem in particular. Notice verse 2, Son of man caused Jerusalem to know her abominations. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem. And so the reason that Jerusalem is the target really of this particular chapter is because it was the center of national idolatry. Although there were there were groves on every hillside, uh, as we saw in Ezekiel chapter 8 when he's taken into the very temple itself, the very temple had become a place of idolatry. And so it was the center, the, the epicenter, if you like, of national idolatry. Uh, and so the narrative opens by addressing Jerusalem, but as the chapter develops, it's very apparent that it has the southern kingdom of Judah in view because it talks about Judah's sister, uh, talks about Samaria, which is obviously Israel, and it talks about Sodom. And so it's comparing the southern kingdom, and it's going to make a comparison between the southern kingdom and Sodom and the southern kingdom and Samaria. So Jude is going to be compared with Sodom and Samaria. And, and amazingly, he's going to say that their sin was even greater than Sodom and Samaria. So it's kind of a staggering chapter in many ways. But the primary picture here that's going to be communicated is that it's a history from the beginning of the nation to its relationship to Jehovah as its wife. And because it, proves to be unfaithful, breaks, as it were, its covenant relationship with its husband, Jehovah. Therefore, judgment must come. But eventually, restoration occurs under the new covenant. So all of this is a pretty grim chapter. It ends on a very high note with the thought of restitution. So that's good to be reminded as we're going to look through this chapter. But um, it's generally a parable of a woman who becomes the bride of Jehovah and then committed adultery. It recounts the history of Jerusalem's sins and Israel's, telling the whole story from her birth, marriage, subsequent spiritual uh, prostitution, and the following sad consequences of ruin and exile. And one of the things you'll notice is that the, the term whoredom and harlotry is used over and over again. In fact, just to give a general summary, what's interesting is that in the first 14 verses, um, there's a lot of a personal pronoun mentioned. And it's it's always has the idea of, of what the Lord has done for them. So I want you just to notice. And so, for instance, verse 6, when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, this is verse 6, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Verse 7, I have caused thee to multiply. Verse uh, 8, now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, entered into a covenant with thee. Verse 9, then washed I thee with water, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee, 
and several times in verse 10, I girded thee about, I covered thee with silk. Verse 11, I decked thee with ornaments, I put bracelets upon thy hands. Verse 12, I put a jewel on thy forehead. Uh, verse 14, at the end of verse 14, he says, which I had put upon thee. And so the thought in the first 14 verses is this, this is all that the Lord has done for you. A reminder of all the Lord did for them as a nation. And yet, from verse 15 down to verse 41, whore or whoredoms is mentioned 18 or 19 times. Despite all that God had done for them, they played the harlot. Now, here's, here's the, the main point I want us to get this, this morning. How did that happen? When the Lord had done so much for them, when they came from such a, a humble origin and the Lord did so much to beautify them and to invest in them and to make them lovely and all of these things, how is it that they went to whoredom so quickly? And I want to give you the kind of cliff notes, the quick answer in this chapter. And it's really interesting. If you notice in verse 22, he says, And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, Thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou was naked and bare and was polluted in thy blood. Notice again, verse 43. It says, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. And so the reason that they turned out to be such an idolatrous nation is they forgot where they came from and they forgot what the Lord had done for them. Isn't that a, a, a really powerful message for all of us? You see, if we forget what we once were when the Lord met us and forget all the Lord has done for us, it'd be very easy for us to follow in Israel's footsteps. And so I have to think, in fact, somebody sung it earlier this morning, King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. And I want to suggest to you that if we lose sight of what we were, the pit from which we've been digged, as the psalmist would say, and what the Lord has done for us, putting our feet on a rock and uh, blessing us so much, if we forget that, then we're in just as much danger as this wayward nation of going and giving ourselves over to spiritual idolatry. And so he really wants to hammer home this message. Never forget all that the Lord has done for you. Never forget what you once were before the Lord intervened in your life, or even when you might, what you might be have been today had the Lord not intervened in your life. It's good to remind us, and I think one of the safeguards against this is the weekly remembrance of the Lord's Supper. It's wonderful, isn't it, to be reminded every week what the Lord has done for us. What we're going to see in this chapter is the Lord takes his wife to court and bears witness of her unfaithfulness unto him. And so it's a very, very sobering chapter. And so, again, just a, just a little word for all of us here. Things that we've seen here in these, kind of spanning these three chapters, we, we saw that <clears throat> there comes a point if people persist in their rebellion against God, that even the finest intercessors, it's too late for them. We saw that in chapter 14. Chapter 15, we saw that there's no purpose for a vine except that it produces fruit. And we're branches <laughs> connected to the Lord, and our purpose of existence is to bring fruit forth for God. And if we don't, the husbandman will have to do whatever it takes to produce that fruit, which may include chastening or may include even removal from the scene if we refuse to produce fruit. And then in chapter 16, if we recognize what the Lord has done for us, 
And if we never forget where we once were and what the Lord has done, maybe the Lord will keep us from wandering away. Because it talks about, doesn't it, in that great hymn, we often sing, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And again, it's because we forget. Lord, help us never to forget what we once were, where we once were, until you stepped in and intervened graciously in our lives and saved us and gave us dignity and purpose and meaning and and put us in into a, a wonderful position of being in a relationship with you, the heavenly bridegroom. We don't want to be unfaithful to our heavenly bridegroom. May the Lord encourage us with these practical thoughts that we've considered this morning. Amen.